Hello, welcome to our monthly webinar. I am Dr. Jill Brooks, Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, a hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our educational web webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. Today, we are so pleased to have Todd Sexton, Chief Executive Officer of Identelect Technologies, discussing HIPAA compliance and data handling requirements. A seasoned professional, Todd has over 20 years of experience in managing dynamic business organizations. Over the past 10 years, Todd has been involved in creating and developing innovative email security applications, as well as champion, championing their adoption across organizations of all sizes. Delivery Trust, the flagship solution of Identelect Technologies, is one of the security products Todd developed, helped develop and introduce to the market. Todd is a HIPAA compliance expert and researcher. He frequently lectures, authors, and advises on security compliance measures. Before we begin the presentation, please find a copy of the slide deck to download from your control panel. Your Paycom CE certificates will be emailed to you within 24 hours. There's no need to request the certificate. For BC Advantage members, additional CEU opportunities will be available in a few weeks following accreditation. Check their website for details. During the broadcast, Todd will be joined by Will Simpson, Operations Manager for Identelect. You'll be able to field questions during the presentation, so feel free to type in your questions in the control panel. Thank you very much. Todd? Thank you so much for having me today. Um, so where we're really going to drive into is where HIPAA compliance is really at in this environment. Things have changed so much and we've really see, seen it this year in 2016. And so what we want to do is we want to walk through kind of what's the best practices that you can employ, what is the information that I really need to be protecting, and then what are you responsible for? You know, it, you know, there's all these security measures that are possible out there. What are you actually responsible for, and how do you actually implement those things? And then, really, I, I think what we're all concerned about is how do these violations affect me? And really, what's happened is there's so much change in where the audits have gone, and really driving into what is my responsibility as a business owner? What is my responsibility as a physician? What is my responsibility as a healthcare professional? And so we'll walk through each of those things and, and walk through how, how do you make this make sense for you and moving forward. So, okay, we, we know there's a huge problem out there. And, you know, we see the big environment where we say, okay, Anthem or Beacon, these are very large entities that we'll see um, the breaches occurring. And so, uh, unfortunately, it gives us a, a false sense of understanding about where the breaches are actually taking place. So you have to understand that most of these um, breaches are happening in organizations of a thousand or less and so we're seeing 80 percent of that and really what's happening is because they don't have the infrastructure in place to really help protect themselves and and so through first health compliance uh, first he healthcare compliance and identify like really what we're going to do is show you some different ways that you can make sure and really protect yourself moving forward so you know obviously we're going to focus on HIPAA but understand there's a real change that's transpired here is that um, because HIPAA is, is actually doing direct audits and they're publicizing the information, it opens you up for other violations as well. What do I mean by that? Okay, so your entity could fall under FACTA, GOBA, Sarbanes-Oxley, and then the state ones, and that's where we're really seeing a huge change in what the state organizations are, are saying because the regulations are really being altered significantly. We've seen four states really change the way um, they're implementing and, and, and enforcing security procedures. So you get a HIPAA violation, you go ahead and pay your HIPAA fines, and now all of a sudden you get another letter from your state or from one of these other organizations that say, hey, look, you've actually violated our regulation as well. So I want you just to make sure and be very aware of how this thing can actually um, 
run through the process and how you can end up violating other regulations as well. So let's jump into the states first because I think it's an, an important thing to understand. So when I say, hey, look, there's four new states that they've really impacted um, and said, look, we're going to, we're, our, our state is really being affected dramatically by, um, by, by breaches, and so we're going to actually make a, a different policy in place. Now, California is one of the ones that I'll, I'll, I'll bring out specifically, and the reason why is because California is the most aggressive right now of all the states, and we're seeing that really move across the U.S. Um, since they've implemented this, you've seen multiple other states follow suit. And so we will really see um, a change in the environment um, depending on what state you, you, you practice in. So California, first off, they said, they went in um, January 2015, they said, look, you know, this is a real problem. We're going to demand that all businesses, um, medical and other, go ahead and, and protect all the information, private information of the individuals that is being transmitted. Now, what was interesting, by the end of 2015, California came back and they said, gosh, our, our stats aren't any better, and this is a real problem. So now that they move into the next stage, which is, okay, now we're going to demand that it's encryption, true encryption, it's NIST certified. So that's National Institute for Security and Technology. And what they do is for the US, they say, look, here's all the right algorithms you need to use and here's all the right procedures you need to use. So they went and took that extra step. And I only bring that up because it is going to affect you and you need to make sure that uh, when you're going along these HIPAA guidelines that you realize that there's other um, regulations out there that will affect you. So now we, we drop into, you know, what is specific items that they need to protect? Because it's really changed, and, and that's something I want you to really understand. So it, it isn't so much the, the content of your medical record. It's more about the personal identifiers that, that show that this individual has this going on. And so what's really interesting, the most important thing that they've brought up recently is they've added electronic email address to this. Well, how does that affect you? And really, you know, what is this causing for me? So any two personal identifiers brought in conjunction with one another creates the ability to have a violation under HIPAA. So all of a sudden, if you have an electronic email address and you have their name inside a communication, now you've already set yourself up for the possibility of having a breach and you have violated HIPAA. So really important to keep track of the information and where it's going. Now, so, you know, we've, we've always been in the situation where we knew we had to protect medical information, but it was so much simpler with physical documents. With the actual physical documents, it was easy to retain all that information, lock the door, lock the file cabinet, and, and you didn't run into as many difficulties. However, with electronic information, the game has changed because there's so much access, direct access to that information from many different levels. So now you have to really look at limiting sharing, use true discretion and security. First off on sharing, this is an important part because you know we want to make sure that a per, an individual inside your organization has the most limited amount that they need to complete their job. And, and that's, it's really where HIPAA guidelines drive it, is they want to make sure that every person in your entity does not have full access to all information. So you really need to limit the security levels at which each individual is able to access the information. And then really true security policies in place, written and formal policies that need to be deployed throughout your organization. Okay, so first off, we're going to kind of drop through internet threats because this is something that's really been affecting things significantly where we're seeing a lot of the malware, we're seeing a lot of um, different threats that are really causing us to work against ourselves. And so we'll, we'll walk through those and some of the things that you can do to protect yourself. And then encryption. What does it really mean? We'll walk through the definition of encryption 
how can you understand it in layman's terms and how do you make it work um, the best for you and your organization. We'll go through passwords and then protecting each of your devices, computer devices and mobile especially because it's really changed of how you have, how we have information on demand and you must protect that information. So let's hit internet threats first. So phishing, this is something very interesting that's happened and we've seen a huge increase of it over the past 12 months. So phishing, there's not much technology in it, okay? What it's really doing is getting us to work against ourselves. So we get busy, you're moving 100 miles an hour, and you receive an email, and this email is asking for uh, dissemination of information, or it's asking for the ability for you to make transfers, different things like that. But, but what it's doing, it's coming from an internal email address or somebody that you currently constantly do business with. So you, you think nothing of responding to the email. So it's super important that you take that into account. Okay, well, what we're doing is they're actually spoofing that email address or recreating the email address so it looks like it's coming from the individual that you know and work with, but it's not. And so one of the big challenges that we run into is we fall prey to this. Now this has been accounted for 4.1 billion dollars in loss in the last 12 months. So it is a true problem and it is really affecting the way we disseminate the information. So one of the best courses of action to implement during this is to be able to have a secure email system that has authentication or it's actually authenticating the recipient. So even if you fell prey to one of these phishing scams, you can go ahead and reply back to this. And even though you reply, it's encrypted and that person is unable to authenticate themselves. It allows you to protect yourself even when you fall prey to the scam. So malware, malware is interesting because malware is really designed around being beneficial, okay? So it was really designed from software companies to provide information. I deployed a new software, I wanted to know how it was being used in the field and what I can do to help the process along. And so in that process, we've got a lot of criminals that have done the same thing. And so really what it's doing is it's capturing direct um, key logging, so it's grabbing literally all your keystrokes, or it's actually capturing data inside your computer. Now, one of the biggest things that we can do to combat this is have a true antivirus and spot spamware protection. Make sure that those are set to auto update, okay, and that you're um, restarting your all of your computers in your office on a regular basis. If you're not, they will not completely update and you will not be protected. They're very good about getting these out quickly so they might notice a scam in the morning on a Monday and by noon there's a patch for it. So make sure you're installing all of those updates. Then we get into cloud computing because cloud computing, you know, it's it's been a great advent because it really gives true um, access to information. So we've never seen access the way we have information on demand. The problem with it is, is as easy and accessible it is to us, it's as easily accessible to a criminal element. So it's a very important thing to understand, okay, and to protect. Um, so, so in that, make sure that when you're dealing with any kind of cloud computing organization, is super important for you to go ahead and make sure that company that you're utilizing has true end-to-end -end encryption, okay? Not just securing the information at rest, and that is what you will run into oftentimes. That's a challenge because still in transit, and that's one of the easiest ways to access the information is in transit. What we have is there, there's, there's these entities um, and they'll actually just scrape and grab information. And it's so easy to do. So they just post up on a point in the internet and they'll, they'll scrape all that information out. And so whenever you're sending an email, understand that that email might make a hundred stops along the way. And in that process, it's duplicating or making a copy of it. That's what we call a ghost image. Okay, that ghost image will last for seven to 10 days. Now, understand that that's 100 copies of every email you sent sitting on the internet 
and for somebody else to access. So if this has PHI in it, is if it has direct health information in it, now you're running into these issues. So make sure cloud computing 100% end-to-end -end encryption that we have. Okay, so we keep talking about encryption. Really, what is it, and what is that doing for us? So encryption, it's it's an algorithm or an ability to only allow the sender and the receiver to actually read that information. If it's captured along the way, then that information is still, it's okay because it's illegible or it cannot be deciphered by the intermediary party. So really important to note, so we haven't changed the fact that that, infor that information travels the same way. It makes the 100 stops, but when it's actually making an image of that information, the information's illegible, so important. Now, it's a true safe harbor. So right now, um, encryption has devised and said, look, if you're using a NIST certified encryption platform, then it is a true safe harbor. And that's an important word to make sure you remember when we're dealing with any of the HIPAA audits, okay, is that if we're using an encryption service so it's encrypted at rest and it's encrypted in transit, then it's a true safe harbor. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I do a lot of um, working with a lot of individual organizations and I still see every time I'll walk into an organization when we look at their given passwords, they make them very simple, okay? Here's the challenge with passwording. There, there's, a, there's an ability to brute force or drive and access a password. What does that really mean? It means I, I, I've got a computer program that's just looking at different combinations until it gets the right combination and then it opens it, okay? Now, if you're like, I see this a lot when somebody says, okay, well, I'm PDF passwording a document and I've got a password on it. Well, those are easy to brute force. You can really drive through them and, and in two or three seconds, I can get the password. So what's a strong password? Minimum of eight digits, okay? Must be made up of letters, numbers, symbols, and capitalization because that is the hardest to actually break. Now, if you don't have a timeout session on, hey, I've tried 10 attempts to put in this password and it times out on me or it locks me out. Any of these brute forcing password systems will still be able to access it even if um, you put in a strong password. But if you have a timeout session, it's way, way less likely, okay? So you can still protect yourself. Just make sure that any of the systems you're utilizing have a true timeout or a lockout mechanism. Um, so now let's go, let's walk through HIPAA audits, okay? So, because HIPAA audits, you know, I'm sure it's the one thing that's on everybody's mind, and it's been really significant on the amount of organizations they've went ahead and audited since the beginning of the year. So think of it, last year, all it was, you were driving in to understanding, okay, how do we audit? How do we go in? So that's what HIPAA was doing. They were saying, look, we're going to be fairly lenient on the process, okay? And the OCR said, look, let's make sure that we get the process down. So when they started in 2016, they went full swing. And so the important thing to understand is they're not just auditing the covered entities, but they're auditing, um, the uh, opening up the audits for all associates as well. So think of it, your covered entity any organization that I do business with, okay, that opens them up. And then if I don't have an agreement with them or business associate agreement with that covered entity, it, with the um, associate, then that actually makes it liable for the covered entity and it makes it liable for the business associate. Now understand, there, there was a very, very important case that just came up. For the first time, and this just happened about six weeks ago, a, um, a business associate was actually held liable um, for not having the correct information for their covered entity. This is really important in how expansive it's gotten. Now understand there's a backlog. So we see and you say, okay, if you, if you look at the stats, you say, well, okay, there's only so many um, businesses that have been actively audited. Here's the funny part about it. There's a backlog, meaning we've audited these organizations, but they're in backlog, so it's not 
showing to the public right now. So take that number that you're seeing um, in the open market and multiply it by 10. That's the amount of organizations that are actually being audited right now. So it's very significant. And Todd, we have a question from the audience here. Um, in many articles that I've been reading, it's saying that medical records are being targeted specifically over other industries. Can you speak to why that is the case? Yeah, so what we've seen is, you know, you, you have to understand, when you're when when criminals are attacking or going after information if you say okay i got i have a username or a an individual's name and a credit card number that has limited value and why does it have li limited value is because i can make two or three transactions on that it's going to get caught and they're going to shut down the card okay very simple health information way different because what's happened now we're saying look i have a name, address, phone number, social security number, so on and so forth. I have a full dossier on that individual's. What does that open up for me? So when when you have that much information on an individual, now I can create an entire identity. The value for that information goes up exponentially. So from a criminal element, when you're looking at where am I going to focus my efforts? focus a, a, an effort on something that has very little value or something that has a lot of value. And so, you know, we have to understand that because of the holes in technology, you know, the, the ability for people to access information, it's also made it very difficult to capture and prosecute a lot of the, the hackers from a criminal standpoint, okay? So now you really have a situation here where you've got a easy access to information, you have the ability of um, limited security elements by many um, organizations, and you have difficulty prosecuting because you can't necessarily find those individuals that were spearheaded the, the, the attack. So really what that has led to is a perfect storm. That's what we've seen. Um, so, so now, when we look at business associate agreements, this is a super important thing to understand because you may say, okay, well, we're a covered entity and we've done a very good job in our organization. What we've done is we put in you know, X, Y, and Z um, different security measures in place. So now you think, okay, we're covered. The problem is, is it doesn't matter what individual or what company that you're doing business with, you are required to have a business associate agreement. What's that mean? So that business associate agreement is really defined around the ability for, if I, let's just say I'm having a, a computer network cabling company come in, so they never touch PHI. Okay, but in their processes, they need to make sure that their business is complying with all um, all HIPAA standards as well. So if they're not, now you have a breach. You have the possibility of a breach. So what what the OCR is doing and Human Health Services, they're saying, look, we're going ahead and encompassing this whole network. Okay, we're making sure that any tentacles that go off of this covered entity can all be protected, and they are prosecuting it. So it is really an important thing to make sure think about it. If I have all the um, necessary procedures in place in my organization, have I deployed that out so it's going to all my business associates as well? Okay, so let's get into the meat of the fine, right? And because this is really a problem um, where we're seeing. So understand, you know, you can have holes in your organization even if you've done every single thing that you think is accurate and complying with HIPAA standard. If you've done all those things, but you still have either a violation or a, a, a vulnerability, um, you will be really experiencing that lower end of the fine area. So per record, you're going to see a much lower um, aspect. However, when we get into these higher ranges, it really is defined around willful neglect. So what's that mean for my organization, right? What's willful neglect? So let's say that you've had you, you are aware 
there was some sort of an area inside your your network, inside um, your system that you said, look, we need to put some effort on this, but it's it's a plan for the beginning of 2017, and that's what we're going to put in place. Now you open yourself up because you say, look, we knew there was an issue. We weren't actively pursuing it and, and getting it in implemented so now you run into this high fine amount and I'm telling you it can get significant now I heard a lot of people say well you have it's a per violation thing and the max I'm going to hit is 1.5 million here's the challenge that is per specific violation so you might get an audit and you have four different violations each one of those will max out at 1.5 million so important thing to understand it's not localized um, to your business being audited and 1.5 million in total you really have to look at the full gamut so make sure that all aspects of your organization are secured so Reporting. Now, this is, gets really, um, it, it gets very specific from an import reporting standpoint because if you know, let's just say you have a very small breach and you say, okay, there's a possibility of a hundred records that got out, but I don't report it. Okay, report the breach. I'm going to say, let's let's just let's just let things settle settle and see what happens. Here's a problem. Immediately, you run into willful neglect. So uh, automatically, as soon as this becomes an issue, now you hit the high fine amount. Because you know it's always challenging for an organization. They say, look, I'm going to call myself out on this, and there's going to be a problem. However, um, realize that one of the things they just changed with HIPAA, and this is super important to understand. Before, it was over 500 records. Okay, so if I had over 500 records, then the reporting came in place, and the and they were and HIPAA was going after um, and and holding you to this violation. That just changed. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you have 100 records, 200 records. It, it doesn't matter what the size amount is. Um, you can you're still violating HIPAA, and they will still go after that for you. Todd, we have a question from the audience here. Um, I understand that when communicating PHI to my patients and third-party vendors, it needs to be encrypted. But what about my internal communications? OK, great question. Um, thank you for asking that. Here's the important part to understand. In the internal communication, it depends on what your network looks like. OK, so now that gets a little bit ominous, I know. So if you have very strict firewalls and very um, uh, strict encryption policies across your network, and then you say, look, we don't allow any outside communication in that network, so it's a true intranet, okay? Now you don't have to have as, as, as strict policies for encrypting. However, that information still must be encrypted at rest, right? So meaning that individual information still okay i've sent it internally it's from one computer to another and now that information still needs to be secured at rest then you look at another thing so what if we put in a policy in place that internal information doesn't need to be encrypted because we've got this veil of protection around all of that information okay fine but here's where it gets tricky now all of a sudden you don't if if somebody's communicating from the outside so you have a doctor inside your organization he's traveling she's traveling now they go ahead and they communicate back in look there's no way to protect that that's not on the open internet now you can still um, connect through a VPN that's getting a little bit more dated in doing so right because you still even though that's a protected tunnel there's still vulner inherent vulnerabilities in it. Okay, it's it's like with using SSL and TLS. Um, they're 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 a good tunnel, and it's a good aspect to have. It's not the be all end all. It's not going to protect yourselves a hundred percent. So, knowing all that in place, I I actually recommend when I go ahead and consult for individual hospitals, um, I, I tell them honestly all the internal communication. I would send securely. Get in the habit, Be, because realize the the uh, HHS has not finished with how they're going to re-engineer 
HIPAA. Okay, you have to understand each of these regulations, they're, they're constantly changing. And, and the reason why they have to is because they put in a, a more stringent aspect and all of a sudden, now they still have a breach, right? So they have to keep getting out the, the, um, the technology tighter and tighter as things go forward. Um, so we, we hit a little bit about firewalls there. So we'll, we'll go into certain policies and procedures you need to have in place. So think about it. The firewall is the access to the outside world from your organization. Make sure you limit the access of that. I've seen where I've went to organizations and they have a completely, we have a firewall in place, great. Well, it's completely open access. What's that mean? It's like, a, it's like an eight lane in each way super highway. It'll, drive, it'll allow information to go both ways, okay? What you really want to do is make sure that you're limiting that. Make it look like it'll end up looking like a toll bridge. Okay, so information comes up. If it's not accepted information, they won't, the firewall will not let it in. It allows only specific ports coming in. Okay, and going out. So important thing to have in place. We talked about minimum access. Super important to limit the levels of access to records in your system, in your CRM system, in your database, um, based on uh, individual levels, okay? If you don't have that and you have open protocols for your entire organization, you will, you will be violating HIPAA and you will get fined. Absolutely no doubt about it, okay? Um, written security protocols. So this is an important piece is that a lot of organizations, they won't have Understand a lot of HIPAA is really designed around the education of your staff and the written implementation of it. Some of it obviously are security protocols and things that you'll put in place, but it's the knowledge of how we're going to do that, how we're implementing implementing that and what the retention and destruction of information is. Those are super important aspects. Make sure that you have a true written policy in place in your organization. Okay. Understand that, you know, we, we were used to the point where, you know, I could I could have a, a, a document shredded and it's no longer in existence. Understand that same thing needs to happen in your network with electronic data. If you go ahead and delete a file, it's still there, trust me, okay? That information needs to be overwritten a minimum of three times with, um, with information that doesn't make sense, right? With, with information that is just superfluous. What that does is it makes that illegible. If you just delete a file, it is still there, okay? That, they, remember we talked about that ghost image? That's exactly what it's creating, a ghost file of it, okay? Employee education, super, 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 super important. You will reduce your um, ability to hit uh, security breaches if you educate your staff. They need to understand what is the information that I need to protect in what avenues because it won't always be apparent to them. Make sure you have an educa education process in place with your staff. And then encrypting. Okay, encrypting data at rest, encrypting data in transit, super important. It is the thing that will allow you to not always be perfect, but it will protect you despite your perfection. Okay, so that's super important to understand. Okay, so now well, what are we really learning here? At the end of the day, if we get a breach, we need to report it. Okay, when you look at the violation of, of these rules, if you don't know what the information says and if you haven't put a true policy in place, you're going to run into problems. It, it, you drive back down, down, down that willful neglect uh, avenue again and so now that's where you really run into these high fines. So make sure you're truly protecting yourself and your organization. Understand that they, there is um, a real trend that's going on that um, C-level executives and the individuals in charge are starting to be held accountable, directly accountable for a lot of the information breaches because you had a, 
your job was to be a steward to that organization and if you abdicated that then there is some 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 actual um, penalties that can be put in place and at minimum we've seen it already where um, individuals of organizations have been removed um, through these data breaches so one of the things that we'll just hit real quickly is identelect technologies and what we really do is We've tried to take it and make it super simple for you. You know, it, obviously, the, the people that are in the field, your doctors, um, your nurses, your healthcare professionals, your, your clients, they're not always the most techno technically advanced in their ability to um, access and transmit information. So what we did is we said, look, let's take away all those impediments. Let's make it super simple and give you control back. We've, we've accepted the fact that we hit send on an email and we've abdicated all of our control. What this does is it brings control back to you. Uh, restrict forwarding, restrict printing, recall a message even after it's been opened. Okay, so we, we see a tremendous amount of breaches happening when we go ahead, somebody's inadvertently sent to the wrong person, happens all the time. And then finally, true policy enforcement. Now this is a super important aspect of it, right? You, you can deploy and educate and um, inform your your staff and really put a, a, a policy across your organization but if you are unable to enforce it you know it's all for naught and so really what, what we've done with this is we've created a, a smart scan technology that what it does is actually scans the information okay and it says if there's personal identifiers you have to send it securely simple Okay, so we plug into Outlook, O365, Gmail, Web, all mobile access, and it really gives that those controls at your fingertips. Um, authentication choices, you can set them as stringently as you wish, and then on the other side of it, you can actually put in any direct specifications or restrictions for that given email. Um, as we as we walk through that smart scan like I told you about it's going to pick up information whether it's digit based whether it is um, uh, subject based and this will do this for all attachments as well okay so it's really scanning for any information and we can add or retract from that library based on your specific needs in an organization okay and then we talked about this other last item was enterprise controls super important under Depending on the size of your organization, you might run into a situation where you say, well, we don't have a full-time IT person on staff, and something like this is challenging to deploy. We've set it up so that you could have a very simple and minimal skill level to deploy it. On the left-hand side, if you look here at these arrows, um, at these check marks, what they do is, that's a suggestion. So I'm suggesting to disable forward. Now if I go, ever, go over here and click on the right hand side and I click locked, what that does is say, this is mandatory. This is how you have to perform on a daily basis, okay? So you can really um, augment and control the, the behavior that takes place there. So today, you know, working with First Healthcare Compliance, Identelect has provided a special discount um, through our partnership with them. They've, they've done a lot to try to bring education to you and really try to help you make sure your organization is compliant with all HIPAA regulations. At this time, I'd like to open it up for any additional questions that anyone may have. Todd, we do have a question here. Um, I'm currently using Adobe PDF password protection. Uh, how does that differ from your system in levels of security? Okay, so understand, PDF, it, when, when the Adobe PDF came out, it's, it, it's, it's a good system in the fact that they actually are encrypting the data. Okay, so the, in the data is encrypted and then it can be decrypted on the recipient side. Here's the problem. There's no limit to passwording attempts on those documents. So what happens is, remember I told you I can brute force this. Just trust me, this, this isn't something that is super high tech and super difficult to do. Trust me, your, your, your uh, 14 year old um, son or daughter could easily set up the program, download it for free, brute force a password. It's not difficult. Okay, so when we're 
deploying something like that, we, we say that we have those issues, now it makes those PDF documents challenging to protect, okay? Because I can try a thousand passwords, 10,000 passwords in a couple seconds and still access that information. Whereas what happens with um, Identalex system is it's true end-to-end -end encryption on the on the entire contents of the document and on the entire contents of the attachment. So realize you may have a secure PDF, you put it in an email, you're sending it to your client. Now the problem is, is you've put your client's name probably in the subject line and you've also put um, their email address. Right now you've violated HIPAA and you have a breach and those are things you have to worry about. So with our system, what we do, the only thing that we do not encrypt is the, um, is the email address. Now that's only one item. Okay, so any two items creates a breach. So understand, protect that information all the way down below the line, everything in the contents of the body of the email plus the attachments. Todd, we have one more question here. Um, what is the price point for your delivery trust system? Great question. Um, so what's nice is we've set it up so we could deploy it on um, any size of organization. If you have 10 people in your organization, no problem. If you have 10,000 in your organization, no problem. The same simplicity. It will range anywhere from $5.95 a user per month. So that's per email address up to $10.95 um, per user per month. Okay, and those are determined on different features that you would like in the system. Okay, so we expand that. Now, as the number of users go up, the price goes down. Perfect. Thank you so much, Todd. If there's no more questions at this time, I'd like to pass it back to Jill over at First Healthcare Compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Will. Uh, that was an excellent presentation, very informative. Uh, if you have any further questions, their contact information is there on the screen, or you can certainly contact us, and we will forward over the questions to Identilex. Uh, if you would like to demo our compliance management solution, please email us at info at firsthcc.com, info at 1sthcc.com, or call 888-543-4778. That concludes our presentation. Have a great day.